Welcome to this week's Sunday Sermon. Today, as we continue through Mark's Gospel, Jesus explores with his disciples who they think he is. When Peter announces that Jesus is the Messiah, his response confronts them with the responsibility and dangers of following Jesus, following him on the road to Jerusalem and the road to the cross. Let's begin with an opening prayer. Most merciful and gracious God, we offer you our heartfelt love and praise because your son, Jesus Christ, was willing to risk everything for the whole world, even for us. We come to worship you, earnestly seeking your will for us. However risky that might be, you are worth it. Amen. And our reading today comes from Mark chapter 8, verses 27 to 38, and will appear on the screen. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Last week, Jesus and his disciples were in Gentile territory. This week, he's in Caesarea Philippi, a very interesting place and a long way from Galilee. It wasn't in the territory of Herod, but in the, in the territory of Philip, and was a town with an amazing history. In the oldest days, it was called Balinas, for it had once been a great centre of the worship of Baal. To this day, it's called Banias, which is a form of Panias. It's so called because up on the hillside there was a cavern, which was said to be the birthplace of the Greek god Pan, the god of the goats. This cavern was the main attraction for Hellenistic pagan worship, where animal sacrifices were thrown into the bottomless pool inside. If the sacrifices sank, the gods were appeased. Pan is also associated with sex and lust. So the town was regarded as a wicked, sinful place to which rabbis forbid good Jews to go. It's not difficult to think of modern day equivalents for such a place. From a cave, in the hillside gushed forth a stream which was held to be the source of the River Jordan. Further up on a hillside rose a gleaming white temple of white marble which, which Philip had built to the godhead of Caesar, the Roman Emperor, the ruler of the world, who was regarded as a god. It's an amazing thing that it was here of all places that Peter saw in a homeless Galilean carpenter the Son of God. The ancient religion of Palestine was in the air and the memories of Baal clustered around. The Jordan would bring back to memory episode after episode in the history of Israel and the conquest of the land. And clear in the eastern sun gleamed and glinted the marble of the holy place which reminded everyone that Caesar was a god. And it's to this place that Jesus brings his disciples to escape the crowd briefly and grab the chance to talk. 
in this most unholy of places where no God-fearing Jew ought to be. Here of all places, against the background of all religions and history, Peter discovers that a wandering teacher from Nazareth who was heading for a cross was the Son of God. There is hardly anything in all the Gospel story which shows the sheer force of the personality of Jesus, as does this incident. It comes in the very middle of Mark's Gospel, and it does so by design, for it comes at the Gospel's peak moment. In one way, at least, this moment was the crisis of Jesus' life. Whatever his disciples might be thinking, he knew for certain that ahead lay an inescapable cross. Things could not go on for much longer. The opposition was gathering itself to strike. The problem confronting Jesus was this. Had he had any effect at all? Had he achieved anything? Or to put it another way, had anyone discovered who he really was? If he'd lived and taught and moved among the people and no one had glimpsed God in him, then all his work would have been for nothing. There was only one way he could leave a message behind and that was to write it on someone's heart. So in this moment, Jesus puts all things to the test. He asked his disciples what people were saying about him, and he heard from them the popular rumours and reports. Then came a breathless silence, and he put the question which meant so much. Who do you say I am? And suddenly Peter realised what he'd always known deep down in his heart, this was the Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One, the Son of God. And with that answer, Jesus knew that he hadn't failed. Then no sooner had Peter made this discovery than Jesus told him he must tell no one of it. Why, you might ask? Because first and foremost, Jesus had to teach Peter and the others what Messiahship really meant. To understand the task that Jesus had in hand, and to understand the real meaning of this necessity, we need to go back to what the messianic ideas of the time of Jesus really were. Throughout all of their existence, the Jews never forgot that they were, in a very special sense, God's chosen people. They always regarded the greatest days in their history as the days of David, and they dreamed of a day when there would arise another king of David's line a king that would make them great again in righteousness and power. But as time went on, they realised that this dreamed of greatness would never happen by natural means. They'd been conquered by the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks and now the Romans. So another line of thought grew up, that God would intervene in history and achieve by supernatural means that which natural means could never achieve. They looked for divine power to do what human power was helpless to do, that a Messiah would come and save their people. In the books between the Testaments, we get a flavour of what the future would look like. Before the Messiah came, there would be a time of terrible tribulation, where every conceivable terror would burst upon the world. Into this chaos would come Elijah, as the forerunner and herald of the Messiah, and then would enter the Messiah. The word Messiah and the word Christ mean the same thing. Messiah is Hebrew and Christ is Greek for the Anointed One. The nations would then ally themselves and gather themselves together against the champion of God, but the result would be total destruction of these hostile powers. The Messiah would be the most destructive conqueror in history, smashing his enemies into utter extinction. Then would follow the renovation of Jerusalem and the gathering of all Jews dispersed all over the world into the city of the new Jerusalem. Finally, there would come the new age of peace and goodness which would last forever. So it's against this background that we read Jesus' words in Mark 8. Having just heard Peter confirm that he is the Christ, Jesus begins to speak about his suffering and his death. And in doing so, he makes statements that were to the disciples both incredible and incomprehensible. All their lives, 
they'd thought of the Messiah in terms of irresistible conquest. And now they were being presented with an idea which totally staggered them. This is why Peter protested so violently. To him, the whole idea was impossible. But what the disciples had grown up expecting, what the Jewish people were hoping for, were the things of men, a human reign, not the reign of God. God's plan was very different and Jesus knew it. He knew it and he intended following it. But he goes a step further and he tells his confused followers that anyone who intends to come with him has to deny himself, take up his cross and follow. Two things stand out here, even at first sight. Firstly, there is the almost startling honesty of Jesus. No one could ever say they were induced to follow Jesus by false pretenses. Jesus never tried to bribe anyone by the offer of an easy way. And secondly, Jesus never called on anyone to do or face anything which he wasn't prepared to do or face himself. That indeed is the characteristic of a leader whom people will want to follow. So what does this passage have to say to us today? What can we go away and reflect upon? In time-honoured tradition, I'd like to suggest three things. Firstly, who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? If Jesus stood before you and asked the question, who do you say I am? What would be your reply? Teacher? Prophet? Saviour? Friend? Who is he to you? Secondly, what are your expectations of Jesus? And are those expectations, like Peter, what we want to see rather than what is actually there, what he actually promised? And thirdly, what does it mean for you to take up your cross? A commentator once wrote, one cannot live as a disciple the way many people watch television, sitting in a lounge chair with remote control in hand, ready to switch channels whenever anything unpleasant, tedious or demanding appears on the screen. I believe I'm not mistaken in saying that Christianity is a serious religion. When it's delivered as easy and amusing, it's another kind of religion altogether. What is it that you need to put down in order to pick up a cross and follow? What do you need to say no to, to deny, in order to allow Christ to lead the way? Let's pray. Creative God, you called us into your kingdom and adopted us as your children. Redeeming Saviour, you showed us how to be servants, denying ourselves to serve others. Sustaining Spirit, you give us strength to take up our cross in the service of the Kingdom of God. Teach us to serve others and in doing so to serve you. Amen. We now come to our prayers of intercession. When I say, in the spirit of obedience, could you respond with, we ask your guidance. Let's pray. As sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father, responding to his call, let us bring to him our needs and concerns, that we may all learn to think God's way and desire to do his will above everything else, that we may be ready to suffer if necessary and put ourselves out and do that cheerfully, considering it a privilege. In the spirit of obedience, we ask your guidance that the craving to be most powerful may be transformed into a yearning for mutual respect and harmony, that wealth may not shout louder than right, and the whisper of truth may be heard above the clamour of expediency. In the spirit of obedience, we ask your guidance, that within our homes and places of work, we may practise self-discipline in all that we say and in the way it is said, using our mouths to speak wisely and positively with love in both hearts and voices. In the spirit of obedience, we ask your guidance.
that those whose bodies or spirits are heavy with suffering may be given courage and hope, ease from the pain and healing to wholeness, that we may know how best to help them. We pray particularly for John, Gareth, Sue, Roger, Peter, Rona, Pam and Janet. In the spirit of obedience, we ask your guidance that those who have died in faith may rise to eternal life and that we may so live on earth that we are all prepared for meeting you face to face in heaven. And we pray for the families of Francis and of Reg who are grieving at this time. In the spirit of obedience, we ask your guidance that as we rejoice in the perfect love and obedience of Jesus, we may find his life transforming ours. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we now say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. A few moments for some notices. This Sunday afternoon, we have the Medlock Ensemble playing a concert in the church in Cottenham. The concert starts at 3.30 and you can either buy tickets online or on the door do come along and support this fundraising concert for the Friends of All Saints Cottenham raising money for the repair and maintenance of the church. They're a fabulous ensemble and not to be missed. And then just to tell you about the Butterfly Project. This autumn season we're encouraging people to come into the church to record on paper a prayer or reflection on life over the last 18 months and their hopes for the future. These will then be turned into origami butterflies and hung in the church as a symbol of hope and transformation. Do come along to the church to complete one for yourself and encourage family and friends to join in too. We'd love the church to be full of butterflies for the back to church service on the 31st of October at 10.30. And then next Saturday, the 18th at 10 o'clock, we have the Macmillan Coffee Morning in the Church Hall. Do come along and enjoy cake and raise money for this very worthy cause. A closing prayer. Loving God, we commit to following you this week into corners of the community we usually prefer to ignore. Help us to pray and speak and act for change. In your name, Amen. Go in peace to love, serve and enjoy the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Do have a lovely week and see you next time. Goodbye.